yesterday, and it would have been impossible to have missed our next speaker uh, and heard a lot about her. But just in case, I'll uh, give you a, a little slice of her background because there is so much of it. I can only address so much in a very short period of time. It is just such an impressive uh, background. But our next speaker comes from an incredible pedigree, but has gone and blazed her own path in the world. Has done absolutely amazing things. Uh, holds a PhD in molecular genetics. Went from her starting scientific career in London onto the Harvard Medical School, where she did important research into cancers related to tuberous sclerosis. Uh, a lot of that work resulted in, uh, that led directly to therapies that help people with these disorders. Now, after her medical research career, she then moved into another sphere, politics, institution building, and used her scientific understanding and her skills uh, in working with people to do a huge, a, a tremendous range of things that have helped people around the world. They have include founding uh, foundations that help to raise money to put research behind rare genetic disorders that are, were being neglected by funding bodies around the world. She has helped to create organizations that have helped pe deaf and mute people struggling with their disabilities, and she has done work that has brought girls and women into the sciences so we can maximize their human capital to move humanity forward. Uh, it is a tremendous list of accomplishments, and she is going to come and speak to us today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the recipient of the grand award at last night's World Excellence Award Night at the WBAF. She is Her Royal Highness, Princess Dr. Nazreen El Hashemite. Again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this introduction, and uh, I'm a scientist, a doctor, I do more work, I write, and then I go and fight at uh, the international community for our rights. To, um, one of the interesting things that uh, I'm talking about through, uh, throughout the years is science, technology, and innovation, and um, how it is important for us in our daily life. And then you can tell, and where, what is the role of women in science? Throughout the five years, women in science issue became like a fashion. I don't know whether I did a good thing or bad thing. A good thing that women in science now have their, they are recognized with their achievements. But the bad thing that everybody is in the next room and the STI, where are they? <laughs> we have the visionary minds here, that's the main thing. I'm not gonna talk a lot uh, about, because uh, I cannot speak in your presence. I'm learning from you. But I just would like to mention about uh, three or four important points. Um, in 1982, my father, the late Prince Mohammed bin King Faisal I, established within Razet, within the Royal Academy of Science International Trust, the Sustainable Development Studies Center. And that was uh, functioning since 1982. And it, that center bringing the experts, the youth, with the governments, with the private sector, and to do studies for them how to move forward. Because we are on the ground, and the others want to develop themselves. So we in, uh, advise governments on how to move forward on certain things. All our studies that can be implemented based on the society and its needs, based on the community and its needs, as well as for the uh, businesses what to do. We succeeded throughout the years, and one of the things that we're still creating is to bring governments with private sector and we scientists or uh, STI experts to uh, advise both of them or to bridge the gap between each one of them. And this is very important. It has been mentioned about the policy. 
the scientists or the business people are moving very fast. And they are moving like this in one direction and the policy makers are in other directions. And there is no communication between them. And funny enough, the science business, uh, the business people will say, oh, this is not working for me, I will go to another place. They don't want to even advise or they don't want to even say what is working here or there. The other governments, they say, oh, this is our system. We are not going to change. You know, because they don't want to say, we don't know how to change. Because the others did not show them how to change or how to develop themselves. This is another a, a very important issue. We are working on this. But we are still a non-governmental organization. And how many businesses or private sector uh, owners or investors want to understand that obstacle? To invest in Africa. Like, OK, about the FinTech, it's excellent. But you need to put a policy in Africa, You're starting from the education all the way to the technology, etc. You don't want, and at the same time, the Africans themselves, do they, you know, d d uh, does this suit them? No, because actually, is it going to change their culture, their beliefs, their uh, traditions, all of these things? So, actually, the private sector here, or the investors, or the innovators in science technology, they do not realize that there is an important need to consider science and society, the sociology, the anthropology, and the culture of every society. I'm not a business person. I'm a scientist, a geneticist. I deal with um, my specialty, genetics and infertility and my research on cancer. When, we, when I develop techniques for prevention of genetic disorders, which is diagnosing test tube babies from genetic disorders, single gene disorders, that was in the 90s. And we needed permission from the British government you know, in order to do uh, clinical cases. We had to speak to the parliament. My brother, who is in finance, told me, just speak to them how much this is important for the government, how much it will save them, and talk about it in money-wise. So I start talking their language, speaking their language. They gave us the permission. So I under, and then while, how I'm going to attract the attention of patients, because I need patients to come to me. With Muslims, I became a Muslim. With Christians, I became a Christian. With uh, uh, Jewish, I am a Jewish. With Buddhist, I am Buddhist. I spoke their language, their beliefs. You know, with Indians, I am Indian. With uh, Moroccans, Kedir, Labas. You know, like the, I spoke the, like them, with the Egyptians. With the Jordanians, I am Iraqi, my accent is Iraqi. And so actually you need to speak the people's language. And I succeeded. And this is what I'm trying to say, that policy makers, they don't know how to speak your language as investors. And you don't want to change because your mind is far beyond the society. It's moving towards profits, starts up. But then, how, as much as we need the starts up, and as much as we need businesses, we still need to strengthen the governments. Because if everybody is going into um, the uh, private sector, who's going to do the work for the governments? I will give you a, a two examples happened. The uh, one during Rafiq al-Hariri in Lebanon, who was prime minister in Lebanon. The opposition said we are not going, uh, we will not uh, go with the election. 
what happened. The election was going, and those who deserve to be in the places because they did not want to go into election, they don't like Rafiq al-Hariri, you know, stepped on a side. And those who have no idea what on earth the, uh, it means to be an MP won the election. And they became the MPs, you know, putting the laws that regulates your life and my life. This is the same thing happening everywhere. And then we are talking about, oh, how this can happen. We need to change policies, but how? So this is another thing. The last thing is how to bridge the gap between your world, the policymaker's world, and the civil society's world. This is very important. Science is not important, means absolutely nothing without people in it. Young people, whether boys or girls, are leaving science. They are not interested in science. They study science, but they don't continue in science. I will, if you go to Burberry in London, Burberry shop, you will see there a lady who has a PhD in neuroscience working in Burberry. Why she left science? This is an, you will, if you go to EE shop in um, Westfield Mall in Shepherd's Bush, I'm talking in London, you will see a guy with master, who is uh, the manager there, with master in pharmaceutical sciences. What on earth he's doing there? So you see, people are leaving science. How you are gonna innovate? how technology will develop, and at the end of the day, always think about keeping people, attracting people in science, make them believe with the innovation with gov in governments, because image is not everything. The youth, I work with youth every day. If you look at my cell phone, God knows how many groups I have that I mentor from around the world. The problem with the youth, that they see you designing their world, they see everything happening on LinkedIn, everyone is an expert, everyone is a consultant, everyone knows everything. And as you just mentioned, so many information. You know, then they are lost. They wanna be like this. They wanna just jump from zero to 10. Oh, we are the generation of technology. Will you believe it? I have youth. They don't know how to prepare PowerPoint slides who are at universities. This is the generation of technology. Then you need to go back into the basics in order to succeed in the angel investors and in any other programs. And sometimes we need to go from the top to the bottom. Maybe I'm a bit old fashioned. Maybe I don't speak your language. But as you just mentioned, my dear colleague and friend, <laughs> you know, um, we need to think about our values. This is the main thing, and we need to speak from here. Here doesn't always take us forward. Um, I'm still, you know, like gonna b break that wall to bridge the gap between those who are in there and we are here. And thank you so much for listening to me and giving me this opportunity to be among you, you know, like I'm learning from you. Thank you.